Are these USB cables any good? Or will they vaporize if used? Let's have a closer look to them to find it out. Gritty YouTubers, here is the guy with a Swiss accent, with a new episode around sensors and microcontrollers. We use USB cables for many of our projects and other devices like smartphones. Sometimes our projects do not work and we are not sure if a crappy USB cable is the reason. When I recently showed a batch of USB cables in my mailbag video, a viewer wrote that they are not of good quality. This is why I will have a closer look at my USB cables. The focus of this video is on providing power to our raspberries or other small boards, not on data transfer or smartphone charging. USB cables are simple devices, two connectors and a cable in between. Seems to be quite low tech. Let's start with the end which is connected to the charger. All my chargers have type A connectors and this is good because it is standardized. Next comes the cable. For our purpose we only look at ground and 5 volt wires, not on the data cables. Some USB cables even do not have the data cables integrated and can only be used to power our projects. These cables are only useful for Raspberry Pis and the like because their USB connectors just have a powering function. For Arduinos or ESPs I always use cables with data lines included. At the other end of the cable we meet another connector. Here the variety is wider. Type A type B, type C, mini and micro. Because aside from some old Arduino boards, I only have boards with mini and micro USB connectors. I will just test cables with these. I assume type C connectors will appear over time also on our devices, but for the moment we can skip them. I also have some cables with one type A and multiple small connectors. We use them for example in our living room where we charge our smartphones, Bluetooth adapters etc etc. Also on my trips I always have one of these with me. What is essential for a USB cable? My wife would probably say the color and the length. And if I look at the offerings on Banggood or AliExpress it seems that stylish connectors and a beautiful finish of the cables are in vogue. We even can buy branded cables these days. But for a nerd like me, of course, only inequalities count. And this is mainly the resistance. Why is it so important? The USB standard allows voltages down to 4.45 volts. Fortunately, good chargers nearly never reach such low levels. But our devices are USB certified and tested for this minimum voltage. But why would we have to supply at least 4.45 volts? Our chips run on 3.3 volts and an ESP8266 runs even at 3 volts. Does that mean that we can go much lower than the 4.45 volts at the input of a device? I would say yes a little. But because our chips are quite fast, they do not like even the smallest drop below these voltage levels. Otherwise they can perform an unplanned reset or lose data or get blocked. But how low can we go? Behind the USB connector on our boards we find a voltage regulator, quite often an analog one. If we have bad luck, this regulator is one of our well-known AMS1117. Its name is Low Dropout Regulator, but in reality it needs at least 1 volt to do a proper job. So if we are below 4.3 volts at the input of the voltage regulator, we can already get into trouble. Of course, many of our devices use much better regulators who only need a few hundred millivolt to do their job. Then we can operate with lower input voltages. But for today, I assume we want to have at least 4.45 volts on the PCB where the USB connector is soldered on. This is our endpoint. Let's assume the charger delivers stable 5 volts. 
where does the charger measure its voltage? Right, behind its USB connector. So this is our starting point. Let's look at what's in between the two points. First is the connector of the charger. I also include the resistance between the pins of the male and the female type A connector. And keep in mind, we always have two contacts, one for the positive and one for the ground side. These resistances sum up. Type A connectors fortunately have pins with relatively big surface and therefore a low resistance. Next are the solder joints of the cable to the connector and the cable itself, also here times 2. Then we come to the solder joint of the opposite connector. If you look at the micro USB plug, you see that you cannot solder thick cables to these tiny pins. And also the surface of the pins inside the connectors are much smaller than in the bigger type A connectors. The last resistor we have to take into account is the solder joint to the PCB side of the small USB connector. Now we know all the resistances which have an influence. How do we measure this voltage drop of the whole cable? This is simple and, if we pay attention, also correct. Correct means that we have to eliminate all influences which are not between our start and end point. I use the well-known four-wire method. I connect a female type A connector to my power supply to simulate a USB charger and measure the voltage precisely at the input of this plug. Like that, I avoid all losses of the cable from the power supply to this point. I do this with this UNI-T multimeter. Next, I connect my electronic load to the other end of the cable. Also here, I measure the voltage as close as possible to the connector pins. The voltage here is measured with the remote sense cable of the IT8512A electronic load. It acts as an independent voltage meter. The electronic load regulates the current to a defined value. And because current does not disappear, we do not need to measure the current at the input of the cable. It will be the same as in the load. To get a first impression of the situation, I use a little physics. Resistors convert electrical energy in heat. If we measure temperature, we get an indication where resistance is. I do this with my FLIR infrared camera. Without current, we do not see a lot of heat. To view the effect fast, I inject 5 amperes to our cable, which is much too much. We saw before that the current is everywhere the same and dissipated power P equals R times I square 2. So high temperature also means high resistance and we can visually search for it. Cool. Or in this case, hot. For a first test I use a short three-way cable. When the current starts to flow, we quickly see where the heat is generated in the small micro USB connector and in the cable itself. The big type A connector stays cool. If I take a short single cable, we see a similar effect. But what about the mini USB connector? I use a short mini USB cable for the next test and we see that the connector does heat up but less than the micro USB connector. Without measuring any voltages, we already learned a lot. Learning number one, the micro USB connector has a high resistance. Learning number two, the mini USB connector is a little better in this respect. Learning number three, the wires dissipate in all cases a lot of energy. So longer cables most probably will have more losses. Let's have a closer look. To measure the resistance and therefore the voltage loss of the cable, I use 2 ampere. Why that? Most of our devices do not consume this amount of current. I do this because Ohm's law is valid for all currents. And as long as I do not destroy something with an overcurrent, I get the same resistance for 0.2 ampere as I measure for 2 ampere. But because I can deal with 10 times higher values, 
small measuring errors do not count as much. As you see, I'm an engineer and not a physicist. By the way, do you know the difference between a physicist and an engineer? Bad people say that physicists know why it works, but cannot do it. And engineers can do it, but do not know why. Anyway, let's do the calculation for a hypothetical cable. If we would measure 5 volts at one end and 4.3 volts at the other, we know that we lost 0.7 volts in the cable, including connectors. The total resistance, therefore, is 0.7 volt divided by 2 ampere equals 0.35 ohms. And now we see the problem of shitty cables quite clear. Even small resistances can create problems. A total resistance of only 0.35 ohms can already lead to a critical situation at 2 amperes. And if one of our devices produces current spikes like our ESP8266 without large capacitors across VCC and ground, also a good charger might not stay on precisely 5 volts. At least it can have short time drops and this helps to worsen the situation. I did not film the measurements because they were repetitive and boring. This table shows the results. Because more and more devices use micro USB, I tested more of them. Here the shortest cable is also the best. But the first three have a similar voltage drop and also resistance. It gets slightly bigger with longer cables. For the micro USB cables the best is 53 cm long and it has a voltage drop of 0.45 volts, which is in the range of the much shorter micro USB cables. As a comparison, I tested a type A to micro USB adapter. It also has a voltage drop of 0.38 volts, which is close to the best cable. So connectors really matter. Which cables are acceptable? I distinguish between small devices represented by the two ESP boards and bigger devices represented by the Raspberry Pi 3, respective the Raspberry Zero W. For ESPs I would accept a voltage drop of 0.55V at 250mA which results in a resistance of 2.2 ohms. Because these resistances are quite small, I would add 50% margin for wear and tear of the plugs. Then we end up at 1.5 ohms for new connectors. Looking at the micro USB table, all short cables pass this test. Most of the longer cables are not recommended. However, there is one exception. This 1.5 meter long blue cable is quite good for its length. This judgment is only valid if we do not play with motors or power LEDs connected to our ESPs. For such projects I anyway do not recommend USB cables as a power source. And maybe 12 volts is anyway a better voltage to power motors. What about the raspberries? I would put the Zero in the same class as the ESPs. The RPI3 however is a different case. Already the bare bone RPI needs 400 mA and it can quickly go higher if it has to calculate heavy stuff. And maybe you add a few USB devices. So I would set the threshold for 0.55 volts at 700 mA which results in a resistance of 0.78 ohms. Plus the 50% margins results in 0.52 ohms. Still here, around 50% of the tested cables are ok, including the long blue one. Which cable is the crappiest? This white one is definitely not usable. So we will send it to hell. Summarized, we learned that not only the wires in the cables are essential for the results. Especially the small micro USB connectors add resistance. The mini USB connector would be a little better in this respect, but it is no more used very often. The cables dissipate in all cases a lot of energy, so shorter cables in general are better. But still, most cables can be used for our ESPs or Raspberry Pi Zeros, 
and about 50% of them can also be used for a Raspberry Pi 3. How can we find out? Buy a few of these connectors and do the test for your cables. Or you use a cheap USB load with a micro USB to A adapter. Or you use your Raspberry Pi 3 and connect your multimeter to pin 6 and pin 2 of the extension pins. If you measure more than 4.6 volts during the whole boot process, your cable is probably okay. During boot up, the Raspi sometimes consumes 600 to 700 milliampere. If you need longer cables, maybe you build your own one consisting of two type A connectors, long thick cables in between them and a type A to micro USB adapter. With such a concept, you can build quite long cables with a relatively small loss. Or you take the route USB 3.0 is taking. To avoid high currents, they increased the possible voltages to 20 volt. But of course, then you have to add a small switching power supply near the Raspberry. But this is a story for another video. Maybe you are interested in the results of the cables of my last mailbag. They are really not very good, as the viewer suggested. Next time I will no more look at the nice colors. Promised. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, then like. Bye.